Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. Each week we talk about heart rate variability and how it can be used to improve your overall health and wellness. Please consider the information in this podcast for your informational use and not medical advice. Please see your medical provider to apply any of the strategies outlined in this episode. Heart Rate Variability Podcast is a production of Optimal LLC and Optimal HRV. Check us out at OptimalHRV.com. Please enjoy the show. Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. I am Matt Bennett flying solo today just to introduce our final installment in our Heartbeat of Business uh, series on the book uh, Ina, Dave, and I have written. Uh, If you're new to the podcast, welcome. Uh, This is the last in, I think, uh, episode 21 in this series. Uh, So please go back uh, to episode one where we are publishing uh, chapters of our audiobook and uh, following that up with discussion. So this will be the final chapter. We're not going to discuss these because uh, the conclusion is pretty short, though. They're pretty pertinent to where we're at. And I think some still good questions there when we talk about things like uh, AI, uh, a huge potential uh, impact on heart rate variability, and what we know and the advice we can give. Uh, I think about this every day. Um, the final chapter of the book is also Dave, Ina, and I uh, talking about our own personal strategies. One of my favorite chapters to put together um, in this writing process. So no real reason for us to talk about what we do and then talk about what we talk about what we do. Uh, so we're going to leave that chapter as a standalone, also with the conclusion. Um, you can go to OptimalHRV.com to download uh, both the full audiobook, but also you can go to OptimalHRV.com backslash handouts to get some of the appendixes, uh, which uh, really help teams, uh, leaders talk about uh, some of the strategies that, all the strategies really that we uh, discuss in the book, including the ones that are featured here in uh, the final chapter. Uh, so uh, please check that out. And uh, for those of you that have been on this journey with us, thanks for doing it. We will get back to the regular format next week where uh, we will have guests on a regular basis. Uh, I've got a lot of great episodes. Dave's recorded some episodes that I cannot wait to share with everybody. So uh, just because the series is ending doesn't mean the content is going to hit pause. In fact, we're going Uh, full force uh, into the future. So we look forward to seeing you next week and uh, hope you have enjoyed this series. I know we've enjoyed talking about it. Thank you. Chapter 10, Interview with the Authors. We want to end the audiobook by sharing our personal and professional wellness strategies and how we use HRV to improve our health and productivity. As three people whose professions focus on mental, social, and medical health, we strive to serve as role models for others. We also want to show you that we are human. Too many books like this one leave you with the impression that the authors have it all figured out. Like you, we are on our own wellness journeys, with all their successes and struggles. Our strategies in this chapter come out of HRV science, research in other areas, and conversations with healthcare professionals. These strategies are right for us. They might not be suitable for you. Please do your research and talk with your healthcare professional if you implement these strategies. What is your morning routine? Matt. I wake up, put on a work-related podcast or audiobook, and take my morning HRV reading. I follow it up with a two-minute HRV biofeedback training session. This short biofeedback session helps me regulate my mind and body before getting out of bed. After my bathroom routine, I work my way down to the kitchen and put the kettle on the stove. As the water heats up, I start drinking a liter of water. I also take a high-end multivitamin with micronutrients and pre- and probiotics that might not get in my daily food intake. I also take a vegan omega-3 DHA EPA supplement and an NAD plus supplement. I use warm water to neti pot and gargle. I gargle with warm salt water in place of mouthwash so I do not risk killing any healthy bacteria that will help my gut health and immune functioning. I find the neti pot and gargling clear my sinuses and improve my breathing during a morning mindfulness practice. Before I leave the kitchen, I finish the liter of water and enjoy a cup of yerba mate. Next, I do a quick set of stretches, many focused on the neck area. 
Then I start my 20-minute morning mindfulness practice. I use the breathing pacer on the Optimal HRV app to ensure optimal resonance frequency breathing to maximize the benefit of my practice. I use nasal breathing with a throated hum on the exhale throughout my practice to further activate my ventral vagal. I am a student of a southern Chinese martial art called Win Sun or Win Chun, which has a set of forms similar to Tai Chi. About two-thirds of my practice involves a slow version of one of the Wing Sun sets combined with resonance frequency breathing. The remaining third of my practice involves a mix of gratitude, qigong massage, and bilateral stimulation tapping. During these practices, I use alternate nostril or nada shoda pranayama. I strategically use qigong massage techniques that support the stimulation of the ventral vagal. Finally, I put my podcast or audiobook back on and walk the dogs. I make sure the sun is up for the walk, and I do not put on my sunglasses, as the natural lights help set my sleep cycle by signaling to my brain that it is time to wake up. By the time I log into my computer to start the day, I feel great. As a bonus, I also usually get 45 to 60 minutes of professional learning done during my morning routine. Ina Mornings are super busy at our house with getting three kids ready and off for school, taking care of our dog, and getting ready ourselves. I wake up, take my HRV reading, and take an opportunity for informal mindfulness practice, brushing my teeth mindfully and taking a mindful shower. I help the kids get breakfast ready and get to school, and usually have some time for my own self-care after that. A mindful cup of coffee, time for formal meditation combined with HRV training, and some exercise. Dave. Most mornings, my routine is very consistent. I wake up, take my HRV, and then meditate for 20 minutes. Meditation helps me feel clear, agile, and ready to take on the day. After my meditation, I exercise for 30 to 40 minutes. I then visualize how my day will go as I plan it out or look over my notebook. I consume 32 ounces of water to start every day, and I attempt to drink at least 100 more ounces throughout the day. Yes, I pee a lot. While drinking my water, I take my daily supplements, which include vitamin D3 with K12, vitamin B complex, magnesium complex, probiotics, and fish oil. After this, I begin to dig into the most important work I have for that day with a cup of black coffee. When my son wakes up, I hang out with him until my wife wakes up. We start to cook breakfast as a family, and usually my daughter will wake up during that process to join the fun. Evening Routine Matt I usually put on blue light blocking glasses about the time the sun sets. While the research varies on the effectiveness of these glasses for promoting sleep, I find them beneficial, even if they only serve as a signal that I am starting to wind down my day. Plus, I think they make me look cool although my wife just laughs at me. As I transition to bed, I do some light stretching similar to my morning routine. I also gargle again with warm salt water. I take another omega-3 DHA EPA supplement, as well as turmeric, curcumin, and a mild sleep aid with ashwagandha, magnesium, L-theanine, and chamomile. I keep my bedroom as cool as possible. I use a weighted blanket, which provides me with the sensation of sleeping under a ton of covers without overheating during the night. Finally, I have an eye mask that blocks out the light. Ina. Evenings are family time. We eat dinner, check on homework, and do something together, such as taking the dog on an evening walk, playing a board game, or reading together. As an introvert, I need some time alone at the end of the day. Once the kids are in bed or in their rooms for their own alone time, I do another meditation practice or HRV biofeedback training, spend some time reading or doing some artwork, and then get ready for bed. I usually finish my day with a gratitude or appreciation practice, jotting down three things I've been grateful for or appreciated that day. Dave. My sleep routine begins with my morning routine and includes everything throughout the day. I stop drinking coffee between noon and 2 p.m. I try to do more intense workouts in the first half of the day whenever possible. As it gets later in the day, I think about what to eat for dinner, as complex carbohydrates may help me sleep better, depending on the day's activities. For more draining days, I eat more complex carbohydrates. For less draining days, I keep carbohydrates low. 
Around dinner time, we dim the lights in the house, change into more comfortable clothes, and eat as a family. We then read books with the lights very low before putting the kids to bed. It is at this point in the evening that I put on blue light blocking glasses. My wife and I remain awake and talk, watch a movie, or sit in the hot tub. Immediately before bed, we brush our teeth, change clothes, and hop into bed. Sometimes my wife will read a book while I listen to an audiobook. Other times I will meditate. Sometimes we just go to bed. How do you structure your day to maximize productivity? Matt. I feel the morning routine I described above is my pregame warm-up. I divide my typical day into four two-hour hyper-efficiency sprints. My peak productivity time is in the morning. I try to schedule calls and more administrative work in one of my afternoon blocks. I start my work day by reading a list of my personal values and the mission, vision, and values of the Optimal Innovation Group before diving into emails and other tasks. I fast for 16 hours, usually ending my fast around my first break. I believe my shake deserves its own Instagram page. While the ingredients list has evolved, the shake currently includes a good amount of cocoa or dark chocolate powder, fermented mushroom powder, vegan creatine powder, broccoli, blueberries, and chia seeds. It is not pretty or tasty, but it packs a ton of superfoods, micronutrients, and fiber into my cup. I usually enjoy my shake while watching a few minutes of Sports Center as a break after my first hyper-efficiency sprint. My second break is a 60-minute lunch break. I find that lunch is critical for my afternoon energy. My go-to right now is healthy, gluten-free granola with olive oil, cinnamon, cocoa, and dark cherries put in the microwave for 20 seconds. It is a delicious and healthy lunch. I also take the dogs for a walk in the park to get some movement time in nature. I put on my headphones and get another 30 to 45 minutes of learning during this break. My final break in the afternoon is a little less structured. Sometimes I get in a quick jog or a wing soon workout if I have time. Regardless, I try to get some movement in. I end my day by sending at least three positive things I accomplished that day to my team. I love ending the day on a high note, and this routine helps me appreciate what I accomplished that day. Ina. After a 16-hour fast, I have a late breakfast, usually around 10 a.m. I find that a late morning meal works really well. I am typically hungry by that time, and a healthy breakfast gives me good energy to dive into work. I am usually most productive mid-morning to late afternoon. I break up my day into sections dedicated to specific types of work. Seeing clients, writing, working on a research project, etc. Building in breaks is crucial for productivity. It may seem counterintuitive since breaks take away time from work, but strategically placed breaks for walking and stretching re-energize me. Even though I end up working a bit less time-wise, I am much more productive overall. On days when I see clients, I build in time for compassion and self-compassion meditation practice between appointments. This is crucial for my ability to be present and focused on the needs of each individual client. When I have an intense project that requires sustained attention, I use a modified version of the Pomodoro technique. I set a realistic goal for my work, turn off all distracting notifications, set my timer for 20 to 30 minutes, and allow myself to focus on that one goal. As my mind gets distracted with thoughts of other things that I also need to get done that day, I write them down on a piece of paper next to me, thereby allowing my mind to refocus on the project at hand. After the intense 20 to 30 minute focus time, I take a five to 10 minute break for stretching, moving, meditating, etc. Then I set my timer at work for another 20 to 30 minutes in the same focused way until the next break. After three or four work cycles, I take a longer break, eating lunch and or getting outside for a while. Dave. I do a modified intermittent fast most days until lunchtime, and I eat all my food between 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. In the morning, I make a large coffee mixed with medium-chain triglyceride, MCT oil, and grass-fed butter to replace my breakfast and keep me in a fasting state, also known as a ketogenic state. There are many benefits to going into a ketogenic state regularly. I do it for the following benefits. Autophagy, or the self-killing of weak and or diseased cells within the body, decreased inflammation, improved energy, and mental clarity. 
I typically remain in this state until lunchtime. I do have exceptions to my fasting days, as I will explain later in the recovery section. I exercise at least once every day or I get irritable, and no one wants to be around me. Joking. Kind of. I always do my base weightlifting routine first thing in the morning. I attempt to do some form of cardiovascular-specific work at least twice per week, usually sprinting or mountain biking. I also do Brazilian jiu-jitsu at least twice a week, arguably the most strenuous workout anyone can do. I focus on my most important work first thing in the morning, before any distractions and when my brain is at its best. I find as the day goes by, my mental ability drops. If it is a day when I am seeing patients, they get 100% of my love and focus during their time with me, so I will rarely do work outside of that to be my best for them. Coffee is my most used supplement and cognitive enhancement strategy. I've experimented with many others and found coffee to have the most consistent, reliable effects. Occasionally, I will use supplements such as pyroloquinoline, PQQ, to help with cognitive enhancement. What I have found with all nootropics and other supplements claiming cognitive enhancement is that they are hit or miss for effectiveness based on several factors and, even then, they provide inconsistent results. What is your strategy to reach peak performance for significant work events? Matt My big events are typically trainings that I'm facilitating. I feel like everything above sets me up nicely for peak performance. The one change I make is taking a hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold shower as close to the event as possible. The shower puts me in a mental and physical space to perform at my best. Ina Sleep is always incredibly important for peak performance. I'm not talking about the pressure to sleep before a big event. I generally pay attention to my sleep, giving myself enough time to sleep and address any sleep issues that pop up right away. This way, I am in charge of what's under my control. Whether or not I get good sleep on any particular night is much less under my control. Sometimes things happen and I just don't sleep very well. However, since I generally give myself an opportunity for good sleep, even if I don't sleep as well on the night prior to a big event, it does not create as much of a negative impact as one might fear. Prior to the big event, I typically spend a little time getting in touch with my body and allowing it to achieve an optimal state of activation without trying to be relaxed. After all, a relaxed state is optimal for times of relaxation, not times of peak performance. A few breaths at resonance frequency breathing rate remind my body to regulate itself and achieve optimal activation. I get in touch with my goals for the performance and allow myself to feel the excitement. Dave. Leading up to the event, I will practice any presentations I will be doing. I will do my best to anticipate questions and have answers ready to go. I also visualize how the event will go several times over a week or so before the event. On the day of the event, I do my usual morning routine, and I will try to avoid eating until after the event, assuming it is before 2 or 3 p.m. I will eat lightly for things happening later in the day. I find I am much sharper mentally while in a ketogenic state. How do you approach recovery? Matt First and foremost, I do not work. Shutting down my computer signals that work is over for the day. My HRV scores clearly demonstrate that if I want to give my best the next day, it begins with my end-of-day ritual and not re-engaging with work or email unless absolutely necessary. The same goes for weekends and vacations. When I turn my computer off for a break, it stays off. I'm starting to rethink my behaviors on vacation. Living in Colorado, most of my vacations involve a lot of activity. Snowboarding, hiking, and snowshoeing are some of my favorite activities, and if I end up on a beach, I'm usually snorkeling or paddleboarding all day. I usually do not eat as well. My sleep is less consistent. I engage in an increased level of physical activity and sometimes travel over different time zones. All these things do not promote optimal recovery or high HRV. I'm starting to strategize more about maximizing my recovery during vacation while still having a good time. Ina 
Sleep, spending time in nature, disconnecting from electronics, spending time with family and friends, as well as alone time, are crucial for my recovery. After an intense performance of some sort or after a series of very hectic days, I need some time to take it easy. For vacations, we go for a mix of activity and a bit of downtime. Dave. Sleep is my top recovery hack each day. I ensure an eight-hour sleep opportunity every night. I have two small kids, so that is often interrupted sleep, but it is eight hours nonetheless. Most days, I will take a cold shower to help with recovery and feeling great. My nutrition will help me recover or push me into a need for further recovery. I avoid common inflammatory foods and those I know disagree with me. My water intake and supplement routine, as mentioned earlier, is another part of my daily recovery plan. Oftentimes, I will add additional supplements like curcumin and extra fish oil to aid in recovery. As I said before, I do a modified fast most days. The exception is a day after I have done two or more strenuous workouts on the same day. Then I will eat breakfast the following morning. When my body is sore, I feel that extra calories help my recovery. Similarly, on a day when I plan to participate in a strenuous physical event, early in the day, I will eat breakfast to load up glycogen stores or easily accessible energy storage in the muscles and liver, ensuring my body is ready for action. If I skip breakfast on these days, I feel horrible physically and mentally. On days when I know I will have a strenuous physical event early in the day, I will load up on glycogen stores, easily accessible energy storage in the muscles and liver, at breakfast to ensure my body is ready for action. If there is a drive home after a big event, I listen to calm, happy music, and I take it slow. If there is no drive, I do a usual bedtime routine and end with a meditation focusing on breathing, which usually puts me out. When the event includes alcohol consumption, I take vitamin C, milk thistle, glutathione, and activated charcoal. If I stay out later, I attempt to sleep in to get my full sleep amount, which can be difficult with small kids. If the night included alcohol, I prepare by loading up on the previously listed supplements prior to drinking and by increasing my water intake throughout the day and night. Vacations can make it challenging to maintain the same morning routine. Often this means modifying or completely abandoning parts of my typical morning routine. Sometimes I cannot meditate first thing in the morning, so I will do it midday or even at night. It's the same with exercise. If I cannot get to the gym or if there is no gym, I have to get crafty, possibly by doing body weight exercises in the hotel room. What I find is on vacation, the increased relaxation, sense of freedom, and loss of responsibility all make my HRV go up enough to factor out any poor nutrition and alcohol consumption. When you hit the exhaustion stage of burnout, what is your recovery plan? Matt. A three-day weekend? An additional day off does wonders for the HRV. I even see a jump by just scheduling time off. I love my work, so I usually only need that extra day of recovery over a weekend to get back to or above my HRV baseline. I would love to present other strategies, but my HRV data supports the incredible power this extra day has on my health and wellness when I hit exhaustion. Ina I find that most of the time when I hit the exhaustion stage, it is because I have not had sufficient alone time. I love people, and I need time to spend with family and friends. I love my clients. They get a lot of my mental and emotional energy. This is exactly why I need alone time to recharge. Without time for myself, I get crabby and irritable. To recover, I will typically find time to be in nature by myself or perhaps with my dog. Dave. I try to avoid exhaustion through the strategies mentioned above. Fortunately, I have an amazing wife. She and I work as a team to help one another recognize when we may be taking on too much and develop a plan to step back a bit. Of course, plans fail sometimes. It depends on how far over the edge one of us has gone as to what action we need to take. Sometimes a simple date night can get things back on track and help the other partner forget about worries. But when one of us has gone way too far, we stop everything and go for a long weekend trip. 
We get away from all the things to remind us of our responsibilities and obligations. Camping is one of our favorite activities and strategies. We find somewhere that does not get cell phone reception and is far away from other humans. When we return to work, our heads are on straight and we can look at concerns with a fresh new attitude. What wellness strategies do you use when traveling for business? Matt. I over-prepare and show up early to everything. I fly a lot for trainings. I show up at the airport early. I would much rather work at the gate than stress about time. I show up to meetings and trainings early to avoid problems with transportation or technology. I usually practice for a week before delivering them so that by the day of the training, I feel great about my material and my mastery of it. I also give myself plenty of time to get to the airport early on the way home, mainly because I might not be familiar with that specific airport and the traffic in that city. I keep my morning routine whether I am traveling or not. I get up early to make sure I have plenty of time to get through my morning routine and get that crazy shower in. I try to find a store with healthy food options early in the trip and ensure I eat anti-inflammatory foods for breakfast and lunch. Often the business will provide attendees with meals, but rarely are they light, healthy options that maximize my energy level and keep my HRV high. The day before my trip, I try to time my meal time to the meal times in the city I'm going to. If I'm traveling east and losing time, I will try to wake up early a couple of days before leaving to adjust my sleep schedule. When I travel two time zones or more, I will also use melatonin to help adjust my sleep schedule. There is mixed research on melatonin as a sleep aid, but it seems effective in helping adjust sleep cycles when changing time zones. Ina. Travel usually disrupts my routine. Traveling to a conference or a training often means that I am not able to stick to the same timelines for food, sleep, and breaks that I usually do. I know that will happen, and I give myself a break, give myself some slack on that. I do my best to build in breaks when I can and still give myself sufficient time for sleep. Since travel days are typically spent with people, I make sure to give myself some downtime by myself at the end of the day, even if that means I have to say no to going out for drinks with people whose company I enjoy very much. Dave. When flying, I do my best to cover my entire body with clothing so my skin is not exposed to the chemicals and grime on airplanes and within airports. I also will dose up vitamin D, vitamin C, elderberry syrup, and activated charcoal to help my immune system. I do not consume anything on the plane aside from a snack I bring and water from my personal bottle. I find that foods served on airplanes are of low quality. Packing a snack ensures I get healthy food consistent with my typical diet. I have trained myself to fall asleep quickly on planes. I put on headphones, close my eyes, and wake up when we land. When flying with my kids, this does not work. If traveling by car, I leave early enough to allow ample time to drive in a relaxed state and not rush. I visualize what is to come while I drive as much as possible while keeping my eyes open and remaining alert. If it is an early event, I will sip coffee and water throughout the morning. If the event is in the afternoon or evening, I will sip water while driving. If I stay at a hotel, I always bring an eye mask and earplugs. The first thing I do upon entering the hotel room is unplug everything. Phones, alarm clocks, radios, TVs, and so on. I have often been disturbed by alarm clocks set by the past person or phone calls from the front desk during meditation or focused work sessions. I take a similar set of supplements as mentioned for airplane travel. I am providing my body with a good defense. I keep my morning routine intact as much as possible, with modifications if needed, similar to what I mentioned when on vacation. I prefer a hotel room that at least has a refrigerator so I can have some of my own food. It is nice to find a room with a full kitchen to cook some meals. When eating out, I have fun and try all foods, but I attempt to limit this to one meal per day. Otherwise, when eating out, I order what should be anti-inflammatory foods, although professional kitchen preparation and sourcing are often not done in the best way. But hey, control what you can, smile, and enjoy life with everything else. I will consume alcohol one day while traveling for business, but that is it. What strategies do you use for low HRV days, illness, or hangovers? Matt. Honestly, it depends on my day. 
I never drink to the point during the week where I have to deal with a hangover. When I get a low HRV score, which happens when I am sick or have trouble sleeping, I realize that I might have two or three good sprints, but I know that my productivity will crash earlier on low HRV days. If possible, I will try to check out from work early. Occasionally, I will get a low score before training. I allow my competitive nature to come out. I do not care if I am struggling today. I am knocking this training out of the park. I pay special attention to my eating and do what I can to limit social events after the training. Ina. Sleep. Lots of fruits and veggies, more water, and downtime are usually my go-to. I've had to learn to listen to my body telling me that I really just need a break, even if it means canceling a meeting or not being able to do something. Dave. I increase sleep and water. I also increase or add the following supplements, vitamin D, vitamin C, elderberry, and zinc. I also nebulize with hydrogen peroxide. I have found that this combination helps me avoid illness nearly every time, pulls me out of a slump, and helps me recover from toxin exposure, alcohol. If I am recovering from exercise impacting my HRV, I might not go as hard with the supplements and instead do some active recovery like yoga or light cardio work. If I ever do get sick, I keep an eye on my HRV and my resting heart rate, RHR. When I see my HRV beginning to return toward the baseline and my RHR slowing down to my normal, I will do a light workout that will help push out the illness. What are you considering changing to improve HRV? Matt. Since I used my COVID scores in Chapter 2, I will update you first. At the time of the example, my all-time average was just under 37 RMSSD. Over a year later, my all-time average is now 76, and my last month was 103. I contribute this colossal jump to three factors. First, focusing daily on my wellness gave me a concrete number to improve through trial and error. I adjusted my behavior to improve my scores. Second, after one of the most stressful 18 months of my career, I took a good chunk of time to focus on recovery over the summer of 2021. During this stretch, I saw my scores hit the 70s, then 80s, and now my weekly average approaches or even exceeds 100. Finally, I started to practice 20 minutes of HRV biofeedback training every night. It is incredible to watch a specific strategy build your resiliency quantitatively over a period of a couple of months. I believe my summer recovery helped me raise the bar to a certain level. HRV biofeedback training took me to the next level and kept me there. The simple answer to the question, what am I considering, is that I will keep doing what I am currently doing and hopefully keep moving my all-time averages up above 100 RMSSD. As part of my goal, I am rethinking alcohol. It does not do anything positive for me, and I have plenty of data to show that anything over two drinks wrecks my HRV the next day. I enjoy a great IPA or dram of whiskey, but I came to the conclusion that it is just not worth it. As someone who only drinks occasionally, I tried Sober October in 2021 and got my first seven-day average of over 100, and it stayed there the entire month. There are no behaviors left in my life that I choose to engage in that bring my HRV down. I think alcohol needed to go. Thanks, HRV. Ina. I've been doing HRV biofeedback training for two decades. It is very familiar to me, and my resonance frequency breathing rate comes easily at this point. That means that I don't always use an HRV device while doing my breathing practice, and there have been times when I did not take my morning readings consistently. I find that tracking my HRV helps a lot, since it alerts me to the need for extra self-care or a need for some other change before I can really notice anything on a conscious level. Consistent HRV and mindfulness training, exercise, and sleep are the three components of HRV health that I pay the most attention to and always work to fine-tune and improve. Dave Portion sizes with meals is an area I could improve. Frequently, I overeat at meals, not because I am hungry, but simply because I enjoy the food we cook, and when it is there, I eat it. 
Same with snacking. Within my eating window, I often find myself snacking because food is available and I know I can eat. Although I am not overweight and appear very healthy, I know I can cut out snacks altogether, put less on my plate at meals, and don't go back for seconds and thirds. I know adjusting my eating habits will raise my HRV and extend my life. Conclusion It proved much more difficult to stop writing this book than to fill the chapters with research, best practices, and strategies. With the advances in HRV technology mentioned throughout the audiobook, the research using HRV to measure a vast range of variables seems to exponentially grow each week. While we all enjoy being a part of this blossoming science and technological revolution, when do you stop writing and publish as you continue to sort through an exciting avalanche of new research? We joked about this conclusion being the introduction of the second edition of this audiobook, Several powerful factors leave us feeling that hitting publish begins another step of our journey. The first of these factors is the COVID pandemic's impact on the future of business and work. As we write these words, a mental health crisis has hit our society. This crisis, along with the continuing public health emergency of COVID, has traumatized people in so many different ways. We know that trauma does not just heal itself or disappear with a certain vaccination rate or return to some resemblance of normal. COVID forced businesses to rethink the very nature of work and the workplace. As leaders search to find a balance between in-person and virtual work, many struggle to find what works best for their people and the success of their business. The gig economy and advancement in remote work had us questioning, what is work before COVID? This question seems even more prominent now. The workforce shortage experienced by many industries at the time of this writing indicates that many people do not want to go back to business as usual. With workers becoming a scarce resource, businesses must evolve their practices to show the value of work beyond people getting a paycheck to work as a small part of a larger, faceless machine. This disruption hits us on the brink of another transformation. Artificial intelligence, AI, and machine learning will transform all aspects of our work and lives. It seems like everyone has an opinion on whether these technologies will create a utopia or end the human race. Whether someone is an optimist or a pessimist, everyone agrees that AI and machine learning will transform everyone's work and eliminate some jobs altogether while also creating new ones. It seems that in the coming age of AI, businesses that maximize creativity and interpersonal skills will innovate and survive, while rigid businesses will not survive. AI might take over many repetitive jobs and tasks, but the next generation of technology seems very unlikely to replace human innovation and the interpersonal skills needed for business success. Developing alongside AI and machine learning, biometric technology will also evolve at a rapid pace. Many of us already put monitors in our cars that send data to our insurance companies on our driving habits. We get a discount for safe driving. When do we get the first offer to lower our health and life insurance if we share our biometric data with our insurance provider? AI and machine learning will help sort out the massive amounts of HRV and other biometric data to help us realize which behaviors promote or harm health. As AI identifies new strategies for health and longevity, it will also help customize the data. While many healthy behaviors will stay universal, soon an AI system will look at our unique biometrics and genetics and create a wellness plan customized to each individual. The three of us are excited to walk into this future with you. As any technological revolution, there will always be positive and negative consequences. We hope that our attempt to put forth a research-based argument in this audiobook as to why leaders should care about the well-being of their people puts forth an example of using technology for good. Thanks so much for joining us on this journey, even if it is just the start. About the Authors Matthew S. Bennett
Matthew S. Bennett is a relentless advocate for interventions that help people and communities heal and thrive. His passion manifests in his books, Heart Rate Variability, Connecting Paradigms, Talking About Trauma and Change, and Trauma-Sensitive Early Education, as well as the Heart Rate Variability podcast. Matt combines his master's degrees in psychology and business administration with his practical experience as a therapist and leader to develop research-based solutions and trainings to improve the health of individuals, leaders, businesses, and systems. As soon as Matt learned about the heart rate variability, HRV, he saw its life-changing potential. For him, HRV became the next logical step in his work with the trauma-informed care paradigm, self-care, and leadership in high-stress occupations. After spending months trying to figure out how to help integrate existing HRV technology into services, his frustration led him to create the Optimal HRV app specifically for those trying to help others live their best lives. He currently serves as the president of the Optimal Innovation Group, a nonprofit organization with a mission to ensure that advancements in biometric technology do not create another health inequity for historically underserved communities. Matt currently lives in Denver, Colorado with his wife, Sarah. Contact Matt at matt at optimalhrv.com. Dr. Ina Kazan. Ina Kazan, PhD, BCB, is a faculty member at Harvard Medical School, where she teaches and supervises trainees. She is a clinical psychologist specializing in health psychology and performance excellence training using biofeedback and mindfulness-based approaches. Dr. Kazan is the founder of the Boston Center for Health Psychology and Biofeedback, working with clients on optimizing their health and performance. She also serves as chief science officer for Optimal HRV, a company dedicated to helping people improve their mental and physical health. Recognized as a pioneer in mindfulness-based biofeedback, Dr. Kazan is a popular speaker at national and international conferences on the topics of biofeedback and mindfulness. She has conducted biofeedback and mindfulness trainings for notable institutions in the United States and abroad, including the U.S. Navy Special Warfare, U.S. Army Special Forces, and the Stuttgart Opera and Ballet Company. Dr. Kazan serves as president of the Board of Directors for the Institute of Meditation and Psychotherapy, IMP, board member for the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback, AAPB, and board member for the Biofeedback Certification International Alliance, BCIA, where she is currently chair-elect. Dr. Kazan writes for Psychology Today and is the author of numerous journal articles and three books, including the highly regarded Clinical Handbook of Biofeedback, a step-by-step -step guide to training and practice with mindfulness, and the popular Biofeedback and Mindfulness in Everyday Life, Practical Solutions for Improving Your Health and Performance. Contact Dr. Kazan at ina at optimalhrv.com. Dr. David Hopper Dr. David Hopper is a father of two amazing children, Jobin and Petunia, and is married to his dream wife, Brooke. Dr. Dave is a practicing chiropractor in the Chicagoland area. His wife and he own and operate two pediatric clinics offering occupational therapy, speech therapy, and physical therapy, as well as owning and operating a chiropractic clinic seeing people of all ages and abilities. Dr. Dave is also a professor of anatomy and physiology at the National University of Health Sciences, teaching future chiropractors and others to be doctors. As well, Dr. Dave holds two United States patents on exercise equipment and ergonomic equipment. Formerly, he was a professional athlete and brings the same drive and passion to all of his life's current work. Contact Dr. Dave at dave at optimalhrv.com. To learn more about Optimal HRV, visit us at www.optimalhrv.com and for our nonprofit work at www.optimalinnovationgroup.com. This has been The Heartbeat of Business, Positioning Heart Rate Variability as a Competitive Advantage. 
Written by Matthew Bennett, Ina Kazan, and David Hopper. Narrated by Tiffany Williams. Produced by Airbendy Media Productions, LLC. Audio engineer, Sean Williams. Copyright 2022 by Matthew Bennett. Production copyright by Matthew Bennett.